Hello. So, thanks for being awake after lunch. The talk's called Urgent Cath Lab or Not because we often get asked to retrieve patients to hospitals that have cath labs from hospitals that don't have them. And the decision has been made often based on the ECG mainly, and the ECG at the receiving centre has been looked at, and they go, yeah, send them. But it's really important, I think, for retrieval physicians, just like emergency physicians, to um, be able to look at an ECG critically and think about whether it really is a STEMI or not. Because there are STEMI mimics, those things that look like a STEMI that aren't. And there are STEMI equivalents, which are those ECGs that will represent an occlusion myocardial infarction, but don't look like a classical STEMI. So I was going to do a talk describing all these different ECG changes, but that's just not going to work after lunch. So I'm going to show you a STEMI equivalent and how we managed it, because that's quite good fun. This was a Wyong to the shore to go to cath lab. And it was a few years ago. And it's a 39-year-old male with type 1 diabetes and epilepsy. And his girlfriend said he'd had multiple seizures overnight. She called an ambulance because he was agitated and confused. And the paramedics had to give him a dazzlam to move him to Wyong Hospital. And on arrival, he had a depressed conscious level. He was hypotensive. He was febrile. And the glucose was just reading high. There was no ketones at this stage. There's an ECG, which showed this. There's clearly some ST elevation, most marked inferiorly and also in V1 uh, with some ST depression. They thought that was a STEMI and referred him to North Shore Cardiology, who said, yep, we'll take him to cath lab. Now, if you had the patient in front of you, febrile and seizures and hypotensive, um, agitated, you know there's more going on than just a... a occlusion myocardial infarction and those of us been around for a while that have instant pattern recognition will probably suspect that there's something metabolic going on with this ECG with the broad QRSs those T peaked T waves um, loss of P waves and so on but it was treated as a STEMI it even says acute MI by the little computer readout at the top of the ECG so we were tasked to retrieve him and unfortunately, um, because he was had a depressed conscious level, uh, they prepared for RSI, um, but he went into a VF arrest. And they shocked him. They intubated him. They gave him amiodarone. They gave him intravenous um, tenecteplase, thinking he wasn't going to survive the trip to cath lab now. And on the VBG, his potassium was 10.3. So they did good things. They gave him calcium gluconate, they gave insulin, they gave sodium bicarbonate, and they got ROSC. And they put in a central line and an arterial line, but he re-arrested. So they gave further potassium-lowering therapy, and he got ROSC again, which is great. And then we arrived, and we found an intubated patient who was bradycardic, profoundly hypotensive, measured via an arterial line on a high dose of adrenaline infusion. And yeah, within minutes of us arriving, his broad complexes on the ECG monitor then became a sine wave and then became a systole. So we hyperventilated him, hoping that alkalemia would cause some potassium to move into the cells. And we nebulized 20 milligrams of salbutamol via his ventilator circuit Gave him more calcium, more insulin, more bicarbonate. We got ROSC. Good, easy, isn't it? High potassium mm -hmm. causing arrest. You give potassium lowering therapy, you get an output back. Easy peasy. Because we didn't know why it was hyperkalemic at this stage, but there's a whole wide list of differentials. This guy might have been profoundly acidemic. Um, from his seizures, could have had rhabdomyolysis from that, could have DKA worsening, um, his acidosis and hyperkalemia, could have renal failure secondary to all of that. So when we got ROSC, did a basic echo, this is, this is his image. Um, he's got pretty good LV function. So when he's not arresting from his hyperkalemia, uh, he had a normal looking heart, but it was always short lived. So just a little reminder about 
the management of hyperkalemia. There are guidelines for hyperkalemic cardiac arrest. This particular one comes from the UK from something called the Re Renal Association that updated them in 2020, uh, who suggests following the ALS algorithm, look for treat identical reversible causes. And if the K is over six and a half, giving calcium for its heart protecting effect. And the doses are on the right there. And you can see that there's a threefold increase in volume for gluconate compared with chloride, because we know that calcium chloride has about three times the amount of elemental calcium in it compared with the same percentage of gluconate. So 30 mils of calcium gluconate is recommended, or 10 mils of calcium chloride. The insulin and glucose to drive potassium into cells and bicarb to do the same thing. Interestingly, the, this is the cardiac arrest guideline, but the same society has guidelines for non-arrested patients in which they include salbutamol, but they've omitted them for the cardiac arrest. I don't know why, because it's pretty easy to nebulize salbutamol through a T-piece in a ventilated patient. And if you don't get ROSC, they then recommend dialysis or ECMO. <clears throat> but we're in Wyong. Wyong doesn't have an ICU, doesn't have hemodialysis or hemofiltration. <clears throat> um, so we're kind of stuck there at this phase of the algorithm. So, uh, you know, at one point we repeated the blood gas, potassium still 10.1. So with all this therapy, we're temporarily shifting it into cells and stabilizing the cardiac membranes of calcium. But the potassium is just leaking out again, um, or maybe leaking out of his muscles with ongoing rhabdo. And, yeah, with this degree of acidemia and hyperkalemia, his, his heart pump was refractory to catecholamine, so he remained hypotensive when he wasn't in arrest. Kept getting recurrent runs of VF, despite multiple doses of everything. We've got no ICU and no renal replacement therapy option for this guy. He's in refractory arrest now. This is a bad prognostic sign. This is the whiteboard in the ED at the time of the drugs he's had. And that's going, you can see that's going over uh, an hour and a half, but that's in and out of arrest. This is not a one and a half hours of CPR. This is on and off CPR. Like even aramine, even metaraminol didn't fix this guy. So. And why would you think normal saline? Uh, I can see normal saline TKV for the central line. Yeah. Yeah, why not? <laughs> Absolutely. The hyperchloremia worsens hyperkalemia, doesn't it, through acidosis? That's right. Yeah. So we're a bit stuck. So do we, do we stop? Is this a situation where we go, well, we've done everything we can? This is a young guy who was a witnessed arrest, who's had CPR every time he's been in arrest. So we really felt like potentially he, his brain was still alive. We just had to fix his heart. And his heart's normal. We've seen that. We've seen his heart's normal. We've just got to correct him metabolically. So is there some way we can get the potassium out of him? And then I remembered last century <laughs> when I was a, a resident on a medical ward, I did renal medicine. I worked for a guy called Morris Jackson who published this case report um, on hyperkalemic cardiac arrest successfully treated with peritoneal dialysis. And for peritoneal dialysis, you just need to be able to put a catheter in the peritoneum, and pour some fluid in it. You don't need a dialysis unit. You don't need nephrologists. And I figured somewhere in the hospital, there should be a, a PD catheter or a Tenkoff catheter, something you can use, maybe a diagnostic peritoneal lavage kit for trauma if they still have one, one of those. You've got to have one in theater somewhere. Um, so send someone to look for it. Dr. Jackson was a great guy, actually, a real old school physician, and he had a good sense of humor. This is me as a medical resident trying to put a whoopee cushion under his chair while he's actually aspirating someone's PD catheter on the renal wall. Um, anyway. <laughs> Look at that little guy. All right. So I thought, well, maybe we could do that. And in um, the adjacent resus cubicle, there was a surgical reg reviewing a patient with abdominal pain. And I said, could you put a catheter in a patient's 
peritoneum and he went yeah, all right so he did during cpr um got him just to cut down and put a tenkov catheter in he stuck it in there so this is pre lucas this is a few years ago I'd never lucas um with us and they, were, they didn't have one in wyong so this is manual cpr which i think is one of the the failings overall for this guy um and we found some peritoneal dialysis bags because even though they don't have a renal unit there are patients in the community with pd so the hospital actually has some peritoneal dialysis bags now you don't actually need them you could pretty much put anything up with no potassium in and potassium will come out um but we thought that looks okay we hung it up to the catheter and we poured in two liters and pre-dialysis is potassium was 8.6 stuck two liters of that stuff in did a quick fast scan to make sure the fluid was going in the right space and penetrated his bowel or something and um after 10 to 15 minutes he got rosc post dialysis after 45 minutes of hanging it we stuck the bag on the floor and drained the stuff out and post dialysis his potassium was 7.7 which clearly is still high but metabolically it improved mm -hmm. to a point where he was not rearresting so this is really interesting so i thought at this point um should he have more peritoneal dialysis i don't know how long to leave the stuff in for should we run some more so i rang the on call nephrologist in the central coast um who went absolutely ballistic at me down the phone <laughs> <laughs> absolutely lost his his uh his stuff um and he said what are you doing putting a pd catheter in i said well it was put in by a surgeon but but this should be done in theater it's an elective thing has the patient consented to this and i mm -hmm. said look there's a reason i'm ringing you i'm the critical care physician looking after an arrested patient i have a specific question for you about dialysis right? uh, that's that's all i'm ringing you for i don't need to have this conversation i'm having to have the conversation later it's going but it's it has to be a full sterile procedure the the risks of infection i said the risks are 100% mortality if we hadn't done this i've now got a patient with an output so i'm happy i've done the right thing all i want to know is how i'm going shall i put some more in how long do i run it for but um finally got him to say yeah run it run another bag and leave it in for a couple of hours something along those lines i uh, said so like i'll ring we'll, we'll talk about the rest of the stuff later but thanks for your help very interesting conversation um so we did a further 2 liter exchange we we put the 2 liters in packaged him for transfer he didn't have any more arrests and in fact he didn't require any more doses of antihyperkalemia therapy and in flight he was weaned off all vasoactive support so he had narrow complexes good blood pressure heart going well having got his potassium down um on arrival at north shore icu his potassium was 5.4 so that was the good bit. Um he um within they, they put him on um renal replacement therapy, stuck a vascath in. I rang up the next day, he was metabolically normal, normal renal function, normal nitrous, normal everything, he had no evidence of any extra cranial organ injury, but his CT showed severe diffuse anoxic brain injury. He didn't wake up and eventually they withdrew life sustaining therapies, and unfortunately he wasn't an organ donor either. So we didn't save his life. We just got him to our ICU intact. So, you know, how does it work? Um, the peritoneal cavity is a semi-permeable membrane that's bidirectional, so things can go across in both directions. And the capillaries in the peritoneum uh, will have obviously blood going through them that will equilibrate with whatever's in the peritoneal fluid that you put in. And water will move across based on a concentration gradient. So if there's more solute on one side than the other, water will move across to where that solute is. So the concentration of your dialysis fluid will determine whether the patient remains uvolemic or whether you take fluid off or whether you even add fluid. So you've got to be careful about the osmolality of the fluid you put in if you don't want to make them hypovolemic. And then electrolytes are moved by diffusion. So we'll go from a high to a low concentration gradient. So if you want to move potassium, you put in a low potassium containing fluid so that's what we did with the dialysate fluid um and we were lucky of course that we could find some bags of, of 
of some fluid that we could use. But if we didn't have that, there are other things you can use. And this is well described because there are parts of Africa where they've got kids with renal failure that they peritoneal dialyze and um, they either don't have access to supplies um, of dialysate fluid or they can't afford it. So they've come up with ways of making it. And essentially, you can just get a bag of saline or plasma light and you can add some glucose to it um, and you can make your own dialysate fluid. So if we're stuck in the middle of nowhere in a rural retrieval and we need to do renal replacement therapy, um, if we've got access to a, a dialysis catheter, if we can put something in the peritoneum, the fluid's already there. Um, just the, the, the conversation with the renal physician was interesting. I did call him back after handover on ICU. Um, I had a cordial conversation with him, but he was absolutely convinced I'd done the wrong thing because uh, I'd put myself at medico legal risk. And the patient may, if the patient had survived, may have had complications of the procedure, which to me didn't make any sense um, because he was dead otherwise. So um, I called him through ACC. So that conversation is recorded and it was a few years ago. I don't know if they keep the tapes, but it would be really interesting to listen to because uh, we, we just had to agree to disagree. And then it was all very cordial. And then I got told a week later, he'd written a formal letter of complaint about me, um, which the head of ACC uh, replied fairly tersely to. Um, so that was that. I'd do the same thing again, given the chance, but I'd use a Lucas this time and hopefully uh, give the guy better cerebral perfusion during the whole process. But just to wrap up, you know, I mentioned there are STEMI mimics and hyperkalemia is a really common one to be misinterpreted um, as ST elevation. But there's a, a bunch of others on the slide there, you know, an acronym some people like to use is elevations. Um, LBBB can catch you out, benign early repolarization can, LVH can, uh, persistent LV aneurysm can. Um, T for Thailand, because in Brugada, sorry, in Thailand, Brugada syndrome, this inherited channelopathy is the commonest cause of cardiac death in, in young patients, particularly males, um, pericarditis. The J waves you get in hypothermia can also be caused by uh, ischemia, by electrolyte disturbances, by um, other things that affect depolarization. And then the last two, the non-ischemic vasospasm and Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, I mean, they're important, but they are diagnosis of exclusion, so they're not a reason not to send someone to cath lab. You have to go to cath lab to make the diagnosis. So those are the things that might cause a false positive referral to cath lab. Um, more dangerous, I guess, is a false negative where you've got an occlusion myocardial infarction, but it isn't an old school STEMI. And uh, I've deliberately not included examples or go into detail because everyone will fall asleep. Um, but I'll provide a reference afterwards to this. But um, abnormal ST and T wave changes associated with a De Winters pattern or a Wellens pattern would be a sign of coronary occlusion. There's a thing called Aslanger's syndrome, which affects the inferior leads. Um, LBBB, and we'll use a modified Scarbosa to diagnose OMI on that. Um, hyperacute T waves, obviously, are an early sign before STEMI. There's a thing called the South African flag sign, which is great, a good life in the fast lane post on that. Isolated ST elevation and AVR, which is called depression, more often is not occlusion, but can be. And then isolated T-wave inversion and AVL um, is fairly specific for OMI, which is kind of scary and not commonly taught or appreciated. So how do you remember that? That's not a nice acronym. I use don't wait any longer, hurry, seek revascularization today, just to give me the letters to help me try and remember it. And I've been trying to apply this as a forcing strategy when I'm shown an ECG in my busy ED when I'm doing 16 other things and I'm dying for a wee, um, I don't want to miss this stuff. So that's my little cognitive forcing strategy for that. That's all I've got to say on that case. Happy to discuss it or answer any questions. Um, otherwise, if you want a copy of those slides, uh, there's a QR code there. and I'm sure this is being recorded. You can access later anyway. We're done. Happy to take any questions. Otherwise, it's a reasonably early finish. <laughs>